Oh, hi, good evening, everybody. How are you? Um, I hope that you're enjoying my money at campus uh, as much as I do. Uh, a little bit about myself, I, um, 20 years ago, I was just like yourself in school. And, uh, but I didn't have the privilege to learn how to manage my money well. And um, David is not here, but if I, I could, I could have joined SIAS after I graduated in the year 2000 because I was a very silly investor, always suffering at the time. <laughs> Spending the first two, three years uh, thinking that I'm an intelligent speculator and lost a lot of my tuition fees and the life savings during Chinese New Year I collected when I was much younger. So um, I've been with my company for the past 13 years now, Shoulders, a UK-based asset management company. And today I feel very privileged to be here today to represent IMAS uh, as I've been involved in their educational work since 2007. Uh, there are three missions I want to achieve today, and I have to do it within 20 minutes. So I hope your eyeballs can look at me. Uh, it's a tough job to have. First thing, um, there are three secrets towards uh, investing well and building an affordable, sustainable investment portfolio. Uh, number one, a very important one, marry well. So um, that is my pitch, and uh, I will share with you later in the middle, uh, in the middle of the presentation why three gentlemen today talk about getting married. So it is actually extremely important, and later I'll share with you why marrying well is a very important first step to be a very successful investor in the long run. Second one, you need to understand why are you investing. There's a huge difference between investing and speculation. And just now, I don't know whether you remember what uh, Mr. David has mentioned. If you invest without knowledge and without a process, it's called, it's called, it's called gambling. So in, in our world, we call it speculation. So I, I spent nearly three years to discover I was a speculator after school, but you know the school fee that you pay uh, along the way to realize that. Number three, which is the most difficult one as well, is to act on it. I discover most people have the knowledge, they understand what is good for them, but it's like going to exercise, they know it's good, but they just don't do it. So today, I will try my best to make you do it, and you have something that I don't. You are young, I'm in my 40s. So you have something and take advantage of it, and uh, I hope that today I can share with you, it is not difficult to build a cash liquid portfolio of a million dollars at your young age in the long run. It is really not difficult at all. It's actually very simple. And I've been speaking to some of the other friends from MAS and uh, UOB as well. Uh, it is actually very easy, so long as you understand the process well. So um, there are eight steps to a simple uh, building process of an uh, investable portfolio. And I'm going to start with telling you that uh, there are four ways to go around doing it, and I'll cover it during the first part. And I'll share with you what I did for myself when I was much younger, but I don't want you to follow my full step as I know what's going to happen to you. So I want to tell you and share with you uh, maybe a better way to do it, and I'm going to share it in the first part. And I'm going to put a very important topic right at the beginning, and that actually echoes what uh, Dr. Sumit shared just now. Cost, fees are extremely important. Research shows that cost and fees can represent as much as 20 to 30% of your gross return, imagine you make 10% and 2 to 3% go to somebody, it just doesn't make sense. So it's very important for you to come out, start drawing salary, and when you start investing, to be very wary that cost and fee must be minimized as much as possible in order for you to stand a much higher chance to build that 1 million portfolio that I'm talking about. And number three, we have understanding of return and risk. And I think all of you guys understand there's no such thing as a high return and low risk. So today, I'm not going to talk about that, but I'm going to jump into the specific of cash, bonds, and equities in a quick couple of minutes. What can you exactly do at your age when you start to come out and work, open a bank account, and what should you do to enhance your return given the understanding of risk and return? And number four is about diversification, which you all learn in school. Uh, today, I'm trying my luck to share with you a little bit on my own perception of diversification and some of the mistakes that my family and I make, and hope that you can see the real reason why everyone keeps talking about diversification. And number five is power of long-term investing. And I'm going to just speed up towards the end of it, sharing with you how you can actually build a portfolio with simple instruments that you can easily access. Within one day, you can sign up all the accounts, set it up, and you can start immediately tomorrow, okay? Cash, equities, and bonds. And uh, for those of you who have interest to understand how does unit trust and ETF work, I also spend a little bit time to share with you how can it be Im uh, implemented in your portfolio as well. Let me start with the easiest one, personal responsibility. It's just like being healthy, you need to exercise. And if you want to build a, a portfolio of a sustainable and affordable uh, uh, a portfolio, you must, you must determine which path you want to take. A lot of my friends, including myself, do it in the first way. Do it. 
and do it yourself and all by yourself. Um, why do I stress on the word yourself? I strongly encourage you to find a few like-minded friends that you have in school or in family and talk among yourself, discuss, share the mistake, uh, share the rewards because you can grow up together learning from mistakes and that enhances the chance of ses uh, being successful in your investment. If you do it yourself like uh, Uncle Albert in front of you here and I spent three, four years after that realizing that I was just a speculator, uh, I don't think you want to take that path. Number two is the follows and do's and don'ts. And I just want to steal a quote from our President Tony Tan, and it was about 15 years ago, he was sharing in a conference I was in, and he said, sometimes people have misunderstood the objective of investment. Actually, investment is all about taking care of the downside risk. So long as you invest, avoiding the downside risk, how can anyone lose money, actually, in the long run? So a debt, analy uh, debt analyzing statement together with myself getting married in 2005 started my very profitable investment journey after that. So do's and don'ts are quite important. So do actually check out a list of things that you do not want to do in your investment and stay by it, don't do it. And come up with a list of things that you should do and I hope that some of which came from the presentation that we have today. Follow it, don't ask why, just try. And you see how it goes in the long run. And I can assure you, you'll, be, uh, you'll find it very rewarding. And last but not least, you can also do it properly. That means you work with people who have walked through the path, your parents, your cousins, your uncles, who have done it, accumulated, learn from them, do it properly, come up with a process and stick with it. And last but not least, this is my current method right now. I actually dedicate the job to my advisor. <laughs> so have someone taking care of it well for you so that I can spend more time with my family, uh, the more important person in my life, which is my wife, and of course, uh, my other loved ones in my family and also at work. So I think this is the right way to start. Beware of costs. And let me just share with you, um, as a young investor said yourself, why is that very important? Uh, when I graduated in the year 2000, I came out and I started to invest in Unitrust. And I paid 5% sales charge. I was thinking, no, it's okay. I have a 10-year horizon. I only pay 0.5% per annum. But you know what? It's too much. So in today's world, there was a young guy who mentioned about ETF. That's a good way to ask the question. There are many ways to minimize the fees. Today, I think with the advantage of technology and online providers, you can easily invest in Unitrust or ETF with zero front end. So that is the baseline that you should start with as a young investor. Why am I saying this? If you have a huge investment portfolio, which typically a young graduate will not have, right? Only when you're into your 40s, 50s, you have a pot of money you want to build, then you pay for advice. You pay someone to take care of the huge pot of money that you have, and you need to pay for that advice. But as a young investor, I don't think we are talking about that. I think we are talking about how to build an affordable portfolio. And in order to be sustainable and affordable, you should not pay those fees and charges. So these are the few things that you should take care of. Sales charge, zero. Do not pay for any things that you need to pay a lot because in the first place, you're not getting advice given the amount of money that you're investing. Be aware of commission, be aware of brokerages, and also be aware of the ongoing charges as well. It's just like um, the story of property investing, which Michael has mentioned. A lot of people keep looking at, oh, property, I can become rich. My rental yield is 4%. But after you minus off the management fee, uh, the interest of your borrowing, and then your property tax, and then you have a period whereby there's no rental, and then actually your so-called gross, uh, your gross yield of 4% become 2.5%, which is higher than your borrowing cost. And all of the sudden, costs eat up the whole value propositions. Likewise, I assure you, in your investment at your young age, if you don't take care about all these charges, it's going to eat in your total return. And later on in my chart later, I will share with you how much this charge can actually eat into your total return. And you shouldn't be, given the small capitals that you're starting with. Number three, it's very important for you to understand there's a difference between performance before and after fees. So don't deceive yourself. Sometimes you make money by trading. But after you minus off the transaction cost, brokerage fees, when you move money in and out of a CDB account, you may realize your profit is reduced by half. So what's the point of that? So you need to be aware of that. And last but not least, can I just beg your pardon? Do not invest anything that is not transparent. Don't take that chance. You can't afford it. Maybe when you are into my age, when you have a huge pot of money, you can allocate 5 10% in things that are less liquid, more, uh, uh, more intransparent, and you get higher return out of that. That's okay, but at your age, if there's anything that is not transparent, please do not touch. Let's talk about understanding uh, risk and return. And let me start with the most interesting topic, cash. Uh, uh, have how many of you heard of this account called OCBC360? Heard before? Please raise your hand. Very good, some of you. And uh, we also have similar products in Citibank, in UOB, and all our lights. 
And I think all of you, the people in front of me, when you start working and draw your first salary, do yourself a favor, open one of those accounts. Please open one of those accounts. Close all other accounts. And make sure you put all your bills, concentrate all your handphone, credit card, everything onto that one account. You know what? Because if you do that, you enjoy a 2% or 3% per annum interest on a daily accrual basis in your account. Can you find something like that now in the, in the, in the very low-risk environment? You don't. So these are the basic things that you need to make your money work harder for you. And all you need to do is to queue up at the bank for 15 minutes. Okay? And there's a limit of, I think, 50,000 or 60,000. But, you know, for fresh grad, I believe that takes a while for you to exceed that limit, right? So I think that's the first thing you should do and put all your emergency account in there and maybe use that as a, as a measure of opportunity cost. If you were to invest in something and you make 5%, minus your fees and charges, you make 3%. A lot of risk in between. And you compare to a cash account that pays you 2-3%, and all you need to do is to channel your bills going into that, you earn 2-3%. Which one makes better sense? You have the answer. Okay? So this should be your fundament, uh, fundamental pot of money and use it as a basis of comparing opportunity costs. Number two, fixed income. Um, there are some people who are asking me about uh, Singapore savings bonds. They are not meant for you. They are meant for people like me. <laughs> or meant for my parents, the older generation of people. Why? Because a lot of us don't have a need to build a, a portfolio bigger than what we have right now. We already have a pot of money that we have made over the past 15, 20 years, and we just want to preserve your capital, beat inflation, stay liquid, slightly better than fixed deposit. So that, that, that kind of instrument uh, is meant for us because our risk appetite is much lower due to our age. But people like yourself, you have time horizon, and later on I will share with you, you shouldn't be doing that and fixed income is a very good instrument to have. Uh, you should have it as part of the portfolio, but I still don't believe that you should allocate a huge sum of your monthly income in the future to allocate into Singapore government bond or Singapore savings bond per se. Because they don't, they don't really protect you the way uh, uh, you're going to live your life, like what my, Michael mentioned about, until the year of 100. So the best way to do is to still invest in equities. Equities. Obviously, equities give you the highest return, and along the way, it gives you the highest risk. But I bet to defer the message. The risk is actually the volatility that you see from day one and from day 1,000 and 5,000, right? But if you understand the power of dollar cost averaging, actually risk and volatility work in your favor. So long as you invest diligently on a monthly basis, over 10 years, you have 120 tranches of small investment that invest on the way up, on the way down. In the long run, you do not need to worry about Lehman Brothers crisis. I was just sharing with Francis from UOB that I personally benefited from the Lehman Brothers crisis. You know why? Because the crisis came so quick. Within six months, the market plunged 70%. So I didn't really average up. And all of a sudden, I accumulate a lot of my investment at the bottom where no people will actually invest in them because they're very fearful. And my monthly investment plan just accumulate a lot of investment on the way down. And when the market rebound, like right now, it, it takes such a long time to do it. Even though the market was like flat over that period of 10 years, actually my average rate of return is about 5 to 7%. So these are the things that you must understand. Equities are a very good instrument for you to build as a foundation of your long-term growth. But please do not use lump sum as a way for you to get into the market. If you have $1,000, do yourself a favor, chop it into 10, invest in 10 tranches. So that's what I mean. And as a young graduate like yourself, when you start working, there are many ways for you to deploy the few hundred dollars per investment, and I hope that later on I can share with you. Diversification. Let me share with you a very sad story. I mean, uh, I work in the finance industry, likewise my brother as well, and my dad loved to invest in stocks. And I always try to avoid talking about this topic with him because I say, I cannot reveal too much about my companies to you, so stop asking me whether this stock is good or bad. And by the way, you know, you should spend more time with, my, with your grandson, right? Why you keep looking at the screen of the stock market? You know, the kind of conversation you have with your dad at, at this age. And then I tell him, can you, just do your, can you just do me a favor? Can you try to diversify? You know, keep, stop asking me about this stock and that stock. Can you just have a portfolio of five, ten stocks and then you diversify and don't let any event affect your performance? And then one year later, during the Chinese New Year, and tell me, you know, son, I, I, I did what you told me, you know? And I thought, I'm very diversified. I said, okay, well, so can you tell me what do you buy? Oh, I got DBS, I got OCBC, I got UOB, you know. <laughs> oh, you're laughing. That's good. I was not laughing. I said, I said that, uh, do you really think that if something happens in Singapore, all these stocks will move in different directions? You, you got the answer. You got the answer. And then you give me a glance, but you say diversify, right? So uh, I, guess, I guess this diagram is a bit busy, but you get the message. So just allow me to just deliver a message to you. If you want to invest, be conservative. 
Look at the line in the middle. This is actually gray color. It says global equities. Global equities will never give you the best return in the long run. But you know what? They are a good starting point. Sometimes the best way to achieve a sustainable, affordable return in the long run is to first of all conquer your greed and your desire to invest in something always best performing every single year. Because nobody can get it right. I will even ask Mr. Michael, can Citibank get it right every year? Or UB Bank get it right every year? Or my company show this get it right every year? It's just it's impossible. It doesn't happen. So a good starting point is to understand that it's good to start with something global or maybe something regional like Asia as part of your portfolio. And just don't look at it because they represent the best opportunities within the world and within the Asia, which is a blast block beyond Singapore, which I agree with Mr. Michael. And do RSP, regular savings plan. One year, you've got 12 tranches of investment into it. 10 years, you've got 120 tranches. Uh, you can create your own Excel and put some assumptions about the average rate of return. And don't be amazed what kind of returns you get at the end of 10, 20 years. And I have some findings for you to share later. Some of you who would like to know about how to do it right in terms of diversification, um, I have something to share with you. Um, after you build this portfolio that I mentioned about, but you just want to demonstrate what you learn in school in real life. So this is my, my, my best effort to share with you what is the best thing to do with your money. If you want to, uh, let's say, increase a little bit more towards bonds when times are bad and increase more exposure when times are good. So by and large, there are four stages of the economic cycles, only four. Can I make a joke out of this? Six times, sorry, I get, where, where I lose my job? Uh, newspaper. They do not tell you when you have an economic slowdown. Never. I've never read any newspaper article talking about economic slowdown. And even if they say economic slowdown, they will not tell you, so what? Financial markets, I'm referring to stock markets, they suffer the most losses, 70 to 80% of the losses during economic slowdown. But no one talked about it. And by the time the media... Uh, or let's say a financial institution like myself or the banks, we start to tell you that if something is bad happening, it's when you have two quarters of negative GDP growth and you call it recessions, and by the time SDI has fallen 50%. So what you tell me? It doesn't help me. I lose 50% already. So equities market always deliver the worst return during this period, but people do not know. Because when things are slowing down, you have doubts. Maybe it will come back. It's not negative, right? It's only slowing down. But this is actually the periods that actually equities perform extremely badly. And that's when Singapore has been slowing down for the past two years. And that is spring where the SDI has been moving. But we're not in recession, right? No, it's not a recession, right? But you notice you're losing money in Singapore equities market. And by the time you hear the news about, oh, Singapore is in recession, and you know what? Actually, that's the best time to buy. Why? Because there's no such thing as worse than recession. <laughs> Deep recession. Great recession. So, Let's assume there isn't a deep or great recession. The best time to invest at your age when you have 3, 5, 10 years horizon, isn't it easy? It's this period. But you must understand we're humans. We really don't buy at the bottom. No one do it. So if you can't do it, how do you do it? I let my wife do it. <laughs> when the money is not yours, you behave differently. <laughs> so sometimes... In order to remove the emotional attachment is to deploy the best person in your life to do it. Not my money. So, another way to do it is through RSP. Again, again, I'm preaching the same message. Because when you invest 120 times over the uh, next 10 years, you will actually invest into the recessions. And just like what I explained to you, assuming this period is quick and sharp, the time span you have investment at the top of the market is very short, right? And when the market crash and start to stabilize, you accumulate a lot of cheap assets without you knowing. And in the long run, you benefit. And that's how it works. It's not difficult to understand. And of course, during periods of recovery, everyone knows stock markets recover. But statistics, economists will agree with me. By the time when the newspaper, uh, when financial institutions say, that, oh, we are in economic recovery, usually the stock market has really run about six to 12 months already. And I'll share with you a very scary statistic. If you miss the first 12 months of the bull run, your chance of losing money is equal to making money over a three and five years period. Power of long-term investing. There's this rule of 72, I don't know whether you heard before. So today I'll pitch a little bit more. Uh, there's this magic number that I work for my life, and it's called 5%. Yes, Uncle Albert is actually very conservative and just one 5% per annum. And by the way, 15 years later, I'll double my money. If you're a little bit more aggressive than me, you can pick 6%. And you can double your money in 12 years. That's how it works. And if you are very, 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 very aggressive and you can't wait, 
you want a 9% per annum of returns, then you double your money in eight years. So that's the rule of uh, 72. The reason why I share with you this concept is to share with you, you can use your age to your advantage. And I want you to see, visualize yourself, the impact of making your money, not you, uh, making your money work, work much harder for you by 1% per annum, 3% per annum at the end of the investment journey. It looks like this. If you really do not want to do anything with your money, and you just put your money in a bank account, not even those 360 or high yield account I mentioned to you, I already told you the answer, you must act on it tomorrow, open it tomorrow. If you don't do it, then after a long 20 years, your 100,000, just hypothetically, this is the amount of money that I'm talking about. After 20 years, you have 122,000. Can I give a sarcastic comment all of this? Actually, this, this amount should be much more. But because you are lazy, you don't make more. So you should think this way. Because you want to enjoy the aircon of the branches. Because you want to enjoy the convenience of having ATM, uh, draw your money at any hour of the day. There's a cost to pay. Do you really think the tellers are free? Do you really think that the rental of the branches are free? No, they pay. Pay from where? Pay from your interest. Instead of paying you 1.5, I pay you 1. Instead of paying you 1, I pay you 0.2. So that's how they actually use the revenue to cover the cost of running the business. So for you, I want you to see the benefit of just increasing your returns from 1% per annum to 3% per annum, which is the illustration I give just now. If you put money in those accounts or some fixed income instrument, very little risk, you see the amount of extra return we're talking about. You're talking about 50% more of your capitals over this period of time. And for me, my magical number has always been 5%, and I'm very proud to say that I've been achieving that uh, since, uh, since I adopt what... Uh, President Tony said, you know, 15 years ago, and I married my wife back then, uh, I've been able to achieve this kind of result in my personal investment. And of course, some of you who want, oh, I, I think Albert is too low, I want something higher, 9%. So this is the kind of returns uh, we're talking about. You don't have to make a lot of money. All you need to do is to allow your process and your investment compound on its own and let time do the work so that you can focus more on your, on your work, on your life, your parents, your loved ones, and then at the end of the day, the money will snowball into like this. Another way of achieving a one million portfolio is to think this way. Um, as, a young, as a young graduate, you, if you allocate $880, which is almost, of course, it's a bit too high at the moment, but hypothetically, I'm still working around the uh, magic number of one million. If you put in $880, uh, compounding at the rate of 5% per annum, every month, you just contribute this amount. At the end of 35 years, which is somewhere around 55, you'll be able to accumulate 1 million. So if you are putting $200 a month, for example, then this amount will be 250,000. So I hope you can understand it is possible uh, to build a nest egg without much effort every month, set aside the money before you start to consume, before you start to uh, you know, postpone your consumptions and let the money work for you at the early stage of your life. And this is a scary picture. Be very prepared to lose your money if you are not long-term. So this is a statistic that shows you over the past 30 years, if your investment horizon is only three and five years, you stand a one-third chance of losing money in global equities. And if you miss the first 12 months of the bull run, I will update these statistics, your chance of winning and losing is 50%. So your time horizon has to be longer than three and five years. Cash bonds and equities, I guess all of us know how it works in a portfolio. I really spent some time talking about cash. I hope you are doing your homework. Get the best deal, you know, open the account, put your salary inside and the bills are coming into it. Fixed income, there are two kinds. One are governments, one are corporates. The corporates always pay higher yield, 1% more, 2% more, like SMRT or you have Singpos. If you, if you feel comfortable, you know, there are better organizations. Our governments are too safe for you. They don't pay you. So 10 years, they pay you 1.9%. It's, it's just not enough. So you can take a little bit more risk, and you can speak to, uh, speak to your broker to recommend you some good fixed income instrument that give you that you know, low single-digit returns is possible. Equities, if you want to do some homework and uh, pick some good stocks, whether it's Singapore or Asia or US, you should do some homework to understand the meanings of P-E ratio, dividend yield. These are the ways to avoid having big mistakes in your life, like myself who touched stocks at 300-400 P-E ratio in the past, a company that has never made money in Singapore, technology, I lost 90% of our capitals. So if you follow this, this uh, yuck states, you're not going to make mistakes. Unitrust and ETFs are tools and instruments that you can use uh, for your portfolio uh, allocations. As I mentioned, please focus on your costs. 
uh, do not pay fund end, always ask how much are you paying on an ongoing basis. ETF and funds are good instruments for you to use. If you use funds, always look at the performance against the benchmark. If after earning management fee, your managers cannot even beat the benchmark, don't use them. As simple as that. And last but not least, I hope the last uh, 20, 25 minutes, I've given you a, 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 a decent perspective of how your investment journey should look like. If you ask me, you should target to do something like this. Assuming X axis is the time, your investment journey is something like this. Of course, some of you will be more volatile and some of you are more smooth. But you should always target a return of around 5% if you ask me as a starting base. And be aware where the peak is and where the bottom is. Don't overinvest at the peak and don't be too fearful at the bottoms. In this case, you can create a very nice investment journey over a corridor which is represented by the dotted line I'm trying to explain to you so that you don't, you don't need to worry whether your nest egg is in trouble during tough times. And with that, um, I wish you all the best. Uh, you have made a great effort to come here today and I'm very sure you do well in your investment and enjoy the journey of investing. Thank you very much.